I'd like to call the Spokane City Council meeting of June 7th to order. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you would call the roll. Council President Beggs. Present. Council Member Cathcart. Present. Council Member Kinnear. Present. Council Member Mum. Here. Council Member Stratton. Here. Council Member Wilkerson. Present. Let the record reflect that Council Member Burke is absent. All right, welcome everyone. We have a, a long meeting tonight uh, because partly we didn't have a meeting last week. So nobody else does the work when we're not here. So that's good. So thank you uh, for being here. And um, we're gonna start out with a proclamation for Pride Month. And I believe Council Member Wilkerson uh, joined by Esteban Arabia. Uh, so, Councilmember Wilkerson. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Whereas Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Pride Month commemorates the events of June 1969 when patrons and supporters of the Stonewall Inn in New York City staged an uprising to resist the police, harassment, and persecution to which LGBTQ Americans were commonly subjected and marked the beginnings of a movement to outlaw discriminatory laws and practices against LGBTQ Americans and achieve equal justice and equal opportunity for LGBTQ Americans. And whereas Spokane Pride, a volunteer organization, promotes and empowers visible diversity for Spokane's lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and citizens with identities beyond the binaries, LGBTQA+, and through the supportive education and annual collaborative events, provides progressive cultural opportunities and experiences for the greater inland Northwest community. And whereas the city of Spokane acknowledges the value and dignity of each person and appreciates the cultural, civic, economic contributions of the LGBTQ plus community, which strengthens our social well-being. Now, therefore, I, Nadine Woodward, Mayor of the City of Spokane, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, do hereby proclaim June 2021 as Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, and Queer Plus Pride Month in Spokane and urge residents to recognize the contributions made by members of the LGBTQ plus community and to actively promote the principles of equality, liberty, and justice. Thank you for being with us this evening. I'll turn it over to you, Esteban, for words, please. Yeah, thank you so, so much. I think in the last year, it's pretty easy for us to understand that love uh, draws us to care for one another. It creates a sense of belonging and mattering for all people regardless of who they are and where they come from. And so to have the opportunity as a city and as an organization to celebrate those who are LGBTQIA2S plus this month truly is significant. Um, and so we thank you for that recognition. I think I also want to make sure that I say uh, that as we enter into this month, may we also be challenged to unlearn and relearn what it means for us to create an inclusive city an inclusive Spokane. Um, we have the opportunity now to really rethink and reimagine what does it look like for us to have a city that is for all people. So this month we ask and we challenge you to hold that close to your heart. What does it mean to love and what does it look like for us to play out love in real time for all people? So thank you so much and we look forward to celebrating Pride Month with you. Happy Pride, everyone. Thank you, happy Pride. And we all belong. Thanks for uh, showing us that way to live, that we all belong in the city of Spokane. So glad to have you here. 
Um, next, we're going to move to a salutation. Uh, Councilmember Mum is going to read. Mr. President, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. All right. Sorry. I wanted to say that we all belong. And thank you, Esteban, for, for demonstrating that principle that in Spokane we all belong. And uh, now we um, will turn to Councilmember Mum to read a salutation to John Dietzman. And welcome, John. And Councilmember Mum, take it away. Hi there. This is a salutation that's signed by our Council President, Brian Banks. And I think he asked me to read it because John is uh, one of my neighbors and lives in my district. And we've served together for many, many years. And I'm very excited to read this to you, John, tonight. Saluting the public service of John Dietzman. Whereas the City of Spokane's Transportation Benefit District Board believes accountability to the public is critical to successfully maintain and improve city transportation infrastructure. And whereas accountability requires that citizens are continuously informed and educated on an ongoing basis as TBD funded activities are considered and implemented. And whereas John Dietzman has been an active and passionate member and leader on the Citizens Transportation Advisory Board for nearly six years. And whereas John Dietzman has also served the city for many years as a plan commissioner, contributing to the future building of Spokane. And whereas John Dietzman also served for six years as the founding chair of the Plan Commission's Transportation Subcommittee, which advises the city on millions of dollars worth of transportation projects. And whereas John has worked tirelessly in his efforts to review planning and transportation projects and make wise recommendations for prioritization and funding of projects. Now, therefore, Brian Beggs, Spokane City Council President, on behalf of the citizens of Spokane, hereby salutes John Batesman for his service to the citizens and to the city of Spokane. John, we'd love to hear from you. You helped shape our community. Thank you. Uh, Council President Beggs and Can Council Member Mom, thank you for those kind words. Uh, Spokane uh, is the best place that uh, my wife and I have ever lived, and we put down deep roots here. Uh, I've worked with many people through the years and, and efforts for the city. I feel fortunate to have found ways to uh, serve and make a contribution to this fine community. And uh, these numerous people I've worked with include numerous uh, other citizen volunteers, city council members, uh, city staff from various departments, including planning and integrated capital, uh, the legal department, and of course, the street department. And I want to thank all of them for their dedication to the task of preserving the good things, the many good things about Spokane and finding wise and cost-effective solutions to its problems. So uh, thank you again for this honor. Don't be a stranger. Yep. Thank you, John, for all your wisdom and service. We really appreciate it and the city will not be the same. Uh, but for your service. So thank you so much. Um, I don't believe we have any boards and commission appointments. So that brings us to the legislative agenda. And I'll just uh, note we, we did make a few changes along the way at our 3.30 session. Uh, and we'll just keep you up to date on that. Uh, we had a few people. Well, looks like we have two people who've signed up. Um, uh, Nicolette Ockeltree has signed up for several ordinances and then open forum. And it looks like um, someone by the name of Marsha didn't sign up for any ordinances, so I'm thinking open forum. Um, but, um, oh, um, so anyway, just wanted to let people know that. But um, we have uh, another little promo um, for um, pop-up vaccination clinics. Uh, that our fire department is holding in our neighborhoods. And Councilmember Mum, I think you were going to uh, narrate this. Oh, happy to do it. It doesn't matter to me. Let's go to the next slide. We were really excited about these vaccination clinics we kicked off last week. We want to show you the dates that are coming up this week. And if you could forward to the next slide. 
Uh, we had nearly 20 people in the first hour at both vaccination sites out at Station 8 and then at Station 17. And then we also held one, I believe it was at Station 9 on the South Hill. And these are our firefighters and paramedics and EMTs who are giving you uh, free vaccination, either the Johnson & Johnson or the Pfizer. And I don't have control of the slides, so if you can go to the next one, it should show the yep. date. She's trying. Hopefully. She's working on it. She's working on it. I can still tell you about it. Uh, and it's really great because we ran into some people who uh, mom had already had her shots, and she brought her two boys, and they were um, over the age of 12, and they were able to get their vaccinations. And uh, they were pretty proud that they were pretty brave, and they said it didn't hurt as bad as they thought it was going to. And um, also, we had a businessman who said he just travels and is too busy, and he's so thankful that he could just drive in there and do it. Um, there, there was really no reason other than he had just been really busy and uh, thanked us for that. And we are also going to try to put one of these together for our 2,000 employees so they can have a drive-up a vaccination spot. We don't, I don't know if we have the date for that yet. But since we're one of the largest right. employers, we, uh, we have a responsibility, I believe, to make sure we offer the vaccine so we can um, get our services up and running and people can come back to work. So here's your dates and where the locations are going to be. These are the three fire stations, uh, Fire Station 9 on the South Hill, 17th and Bernard, and then we have the, um, the one out uh, east on 1608 North Rebecca. They have a nice shaded grassy area. And then uh, District 3, it's right by the little pocket park there, uh, Fire Station 17. And can you get to the next slide, which actually has the dates? No. We're Okay. We're having a problem with it. And just in case people are looking, the districts are off. The first says District 1 is really District 2, and the District 2 is really District 1. But there's a place for everyone. It looks like there's Oops. a phone number, 1-800-525-0127. 1-800-525-0127. Okay. There was one today. And I'll tell you what, um, maybe uh, if we can... We'll put that, try to put it up at, uh, later on in the meeting. We'll do a little commercial break when we get those okay. dates up because it's really important for people to see the dates and time so they know when okay. they can go. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for that. Um, anyway, I guess we can go to special budget ordinances. Ms. Fister. Yeah. Ordinance C36053, amending ordinance number C35971, passed by the City Council December 14, 2020, and entitled... An ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2021, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2021, and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declaring an emergency, emergency and appropriating funds in. Ordinance C36053, Combined Communication Center Fund from Contractual Services, $122,691 to various accounts, same amount. This action allows the addition of three additional civilian full-time employees, all fire communication specialists to support FireCom and the Spokane Fire Department's 911 and incident volume. All right, I don't believe we have any community members who want to testify on this, but this is, uh, as the city is um, taking over the fire dispatch, uh, this staffs us up. For a while, we were very understaffed and we had to rely on uh, county agencies and pay them a lot of money to do that. And this gets us trained up and we're actually hiring ahead uh, for some retirement. So we should be in much better shape on that. Um, but is there any council commentary? Yes, Councilmember Mum. Well, while I was out at the vaccination clinics, I had a lot of folks come up and thank us for supporting uh, our high level of dispatch services and said that it has been working really well. And they really appreciate our support. And they said they're able to talk to victims or people who are on the scene directly and get the information that they need. And they said, this is really the way to go. And um, hopefully we can get the rest of the community um, to have the same level of service. All right. Any other comments? All right, we'll have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai, Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes seven to zero. 
And the next two Six. ordinances we uh, combined into one with the substitute language and our city clerk is going to read it since we just put it in there today, the language. Ordinance number 36054, an ordinance amending ordinance number C35971 passed by the City Council December 14, 2020 and entitled an ordinance adopting the annual budget of the City of Spokane for 2021, making appropriations to the various funds of the City of Spokane government for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2021 and providing it shall take effect immediately upon passage and declared an emergency. Whereas subsequent to the adoption of the 2021 budget ordinance number C35971 is above entitled and which passed the city council December 14, 2020, it is necessary to make changes in the appropriations of the various funds which changes could not have been anticipated or known at the time of making such budget ordinance. And whereas this ordinance has been on file in the city clerk's office for five days now, therefore the city of Spokane does ordain section one that in the budget of the American and rescue plan fund in the budget and annex there too with reference to the American rescue plan fund the following changes be made number one increase appropriations by three hundred eighty thousand dollars a two hundred twenty thousand dollars of the appropriation is transferred from the ARP fund to the parks and recreation fund to support the summer swim program <clears throat> the ARP fund appropriation qualifies as part of the general government services program category B, $160,000 of the appropriation is transferred, excuse me, from the ARP fund to the park's cumulative reserve fund for the purpose of replacing playground equipment at the common, at the Cannon and Logan Parks. The ARP fund appropriation qualifies as part of the general government services program category. Section two, that in the budget of the parks and recreation fund and the budget annex there too, excuse me, I've got to have a drink of water, I apologize. I've got a scratch at my throat. <clears throat> At least you're smart enough to bring water. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> Section 2, then in the budget of the Parks and Recreation Fund and the budget annex there too, with reference to the Parks and Recreation Fund, the following changes be made. One, increase appropriation by $220,000. A, appropriation is provided from a transfer in from the ARP Fund to support the summer swimming program. Section 3, then in the budget of the Park Cumulative Reserve Fund and the budget annex there too, with reference to the Park Cumulative Fund, the following changes be made. One, increase appropriation by $160,000. A, appropriation is provided from a transfer in from the ARP Fund for replacement of playground equipment at the Cannon and Logan Parks. Section four, it is therefore by the City Council declared that an urgency and emergency exists for making the changes set forth herein. Such urgency and emergency arising from the need to budget for new playground equipment at Cannon Park and Logan Peace Park. And because of such need and urgency and emergency exists at the, pa at the passage of this ordinance, and also because the same makes an appropriation, it shall take effect and be enforced immediately upon its passage. All right, <coughs> and uh, we have one community member who uh, asked to testify about this, and that's Nicolette Ockeltree. If you're there, Nicolette, if you want to hit star three. All right, good evening, Nicolette. Go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes on this issue. Hello, Council. This is Nicolette Ockeltree. Um, this is with respect to the 160000 for the replacement park equipment for Logan Peace Park and Cannon Park. Um, what I don't typically see happening when these kinds of playground equipment upgrades have been made in other Spokane parks in the past is a close attention to the holistic impact these upgrades have on the health and safety of the parks and people. For example, more playground equipment and, and a splash pad was uh, added to Glass Park a while back. And it's wonderful. It draws a lot more families from the neighborhood and surrounding areas, especially when it was first installed. But this increased traffic makes all those unprotected intersections at every corner of the park even more dangerous. Without stop or yield signs, you find cars gunning it through the intersection while children are playing just feet away. The on-street parking can also make the sight lines even worse and further increase the risk of crossing at these intersections. The kids who live close enough to the park to walk have a hard time getting there safely Again, because no crosswalks, no stop signs, no yield signs, and poor sight lines complicated by the lack of traffic calming measures on all four intersections, on all four corners of that park. And last I recall, Logan and Cannon Park also have at least one unprotected intersection each abutting the park property. When we improve neighborhood parks and install new equipment, we have to expect that this will result in more people patronizing these parks, and that's a good thing. But with that comes the responsibility to make related and surrounding improvements to support the health and safety of the citizens who use those parks. 
Sometimes that means adding more stop signs or trash cans or bathrooms, but historically those aspects aren't always taken into consideration, or at least not with the same priority uh, when the city approves these plans or expenses with the park upgrades. It might take a more collaborative effort between departments. Um, I urge council to take these points into consideration whenever they meet with or approve park department needs and requests for upgrades. A more holistic approach to neighborhood park improvements are needed to ensure the overall health and safety of the park the people patronizing them, and the neighborhoods in which they're located. And, of course, um, as I've mentioned a few times, I think it would be a great idea to start to integrate more of the uh, trash can animal structures, like the garbage room, in other parks in Spokane. I think carrying the thematic history of Expo 74 in our other parks in Spokane is an excellent way to connect the city culturally and inculcate a desire in young children to have fun while keeping our public spaces, especially our parks, clean. So hopefully that can be considered, too, as we make uh, continued improvements to our park areas. Thank you. Thank you. Any council commentary? Councilmember Mum. Yes, I'm just so thankful that um, this is finally coming forward. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Stratton, who helped me on this, and Councilmember Wilkerson. We started this project back in October. Uh, when we had learned that one of our playground structures was being ripped out because it was so dilapidated that the children were unsafe to play on it. So uh, in one of our most important parks um, that really need access for kids, the kids didn't have anything between the ages of 5 and 12 uh, in terms of a playground structure. And then also learned that there had been actually a wooden playground structure in Logan Peace Park burned. And the, uh, it was slated to be replaced in a couple of years anyway, but the funding was not going to be in place until almost uh, 2020, I think 2024, 25. So I'm so excited that ARP funds can help out the Parks Department this time, especially coming out of COVID. I've heard that the playground equipment has been purchased and on a state contract, so we got a good deal, and it should be installed before the summer is over. And I hope they invite us for the ribbon cut. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, just really grateful to be able to support these changes and uh, happy to, to see investments being made in our parks and, and aquatics. And so just grateful to come forward. Any other council members? Yeah, we just wanted to thank the park board for cooperating with us. Uh, we gave them the money, but they, we still needed their approval. And uh, I think this is a great start this is really the first american recovery plan money that we're spending uh, on our parks and it really is a nice fit with recovering from the pandemic as people need to be outside more and exercise and and spend time with families and people they care about so super happy for that let's have a formal roll call council member mum aye council member stratton aye council member kinnear aye council presidents and i council member cathcart Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero for both of those. I said seven to zero last time, but that was wrong because Ms. Burke is not with us. So, but that passed six to zero. And now we have another special budget ordinance. Ordinance C36056, general fund from unappropriated reserves, $115,000 to police other improvements, same amount. This action allows for refurbishing the training range at the Spokane Police Academy. All right, and Nicolette Ockeltree also requested to testify on this matter. Uh, Nicolette, if you want to hit star three. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself. You have up to three minutes on this matter. We're not hearing you, Nicolette. If you're, if you're there. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, I don't know. Okay, so it seems to me that a no need for periodic maintenance should never really be a special budget ordinance. If a department knows this kind of expense will recur every few years, they need to budget it in. This is precisely why we have budgets, to set aside funds we know we'll be needing in the future for expenses we know we will encounter. It's irresponsible and, quite frankly, unacceptable how many times expenses that ought to have been included in the budget appear as a special budget ordinance. It makes me wonder um, 
and I'm sure I'm not the only one, if the SBO process is from time to time being abused. After all, if the department knowingly leaves out such an expense from the budget with the intention of using the SBO process to pick up that expense later, they have knowingly falsified their needs and, in a serious sense, hidden the true size of their budget requirements in the process. Operating in such a manner is irresponsible, manipulative, and comes at a greater expense in the long run. Of course, City Council will be approving this SBO because maintenance is needed, and I understand that. But it's hard not to see this approach to acquiring funds as strong-arming the council into approving these expenses that may have been balanced in a different light had they been considered along with the totality of the police department's annual budget request during the budget approval process. I urge council to be vocal about the burdenless causes, continue to watch for potential abuses of the SBO process, and keep this in mind when reviewing and approving various departments' projected needs in future budgets. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any council commentary on this matter? Not seeing any. Uh, let's have a formal vote. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. And Madam Clerk, if you could read the next one. Ordinance C36057, general fund from unappropriated reserves, $1,100,000 to human services, contractual services, same amount. This action establishes budget authority for building improvements in the operation of the Cannon Street Shelter. All right. Um, so this sets aside 250000 up to $250,000 for capital expenditures. The Cannon Shelter is going to go to full-time uh, use as shelter and day services, and an RFP is going to be issued for a projected start date of a year-round contractor in September instead of just doing it seasonally. And so this sets aside some money for those operations for the rest of the year. Um, and there is one person that wanted to testify, and that is Nicolette Ockeltree. Nicolette, if you'd like to hit start three. All right, we have you. Go ahead and introduce yourself. You've got up to three minutes. Hello, Council. Um, I just wanted to reiterate a comment I heard uh, Council President Beggs make during the briefing meeting today, which is that I feel like we need more answers about this building. I did look on the Spokane County Property Search website and was able to see that according to that real estate affidavit, we spent $415,000 on the building at Cannon. And as I recall, maintenance on that building had to start right away and even delayed the original opening date of the very first group that was in Cannon, Jules Helping Hands. Since then, I remember seeing a video uh, posted on the Facebook page of City Council that uh, indicated that that building had also been completely remodeled. And I believe that the contractor said it was basically completely gutted and rebuilt in order to accommodate the facility. And now I'm hearing that there is another 250, it was either 225 or 250 allocated for more capital expenditures on uh, repairs that may be needed. I wonder if that could be taken out of this uh, right now since it's unclear why those would be needed after so much money has been spent remodeling the building in the first place. And maybe a full accounting of how much it's cost to completely bring that building up to uh, code, so to speak, to be able to accommodate this facility. And a digging in of some of these expenses, because when you calculate the cost of the administration and the salaries and benefits, you're looking at somewhere between 63 and 70 percent of that total amount that we've given them just going to salaries and benefits and administration costs. And I wonder how much further those, uh, that money could actually go if it was put directly into the hands of those impacted or at least there was a smarter approach to it. So I think we need to consider really investigating this so that we can really fine tooth comb, see what we're getting for our money and make sure that those who are being impacted are getting the best services they possibly can. And in the future, going forward, really looking into when we buy these buildings because this was a terrible building in a terrible location and we have to learn from this. Thank you. Thank you. And I did um, get an email from Chief Financial Officer yeah, Tanya. Yeah, 
Thank you. And I did get an email from Chief Financial Officer Tanya Wallace that said that uh, between the purchase price and capital improvements to date, we have spent one million six hundred and sixty two thousand and ninety nine dollars. So just to get that out there for people. Um, we have Council Member Mum and then Council Member Cathcart. Can you dig into that email? Because I, I think it's important to clarify that the county paid quite a bit of that. It wasn't just the city taxpayers. Yes, I can tell you. So the county did pay uh, 785000 of that $1.6 million that they got from CARES Act money that they invested. They also invested quite a bit of money to help us buy the uh, new shelter on West Mission. Uh, quite a bit more money than that, actually. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I guess to, to Nicolette's point, uh, I, I'm wondering what were those, and maybe Johnny, he's on the line here, maybe he's got some answers. What, what were those improvements that were done? Because I remember getting that open. It was late quite a bit for construction. And so I'm just wondering what was done then that, that and, and what are we going to do now that's different or that's in addition to that? Well, part of, part of it Thank might be... I was just going to say, part of my recollection, and I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Perkins. Part of my recollection is when we first did the improvements, uh, they were basic improvements. And then the second round of improvements that we did were installing um, shower. Once we knew we really were going to use it as a long-term shelter, we were, it was installing showers and things like that. But Mr. Perkins could go. And then Councilmember Wilkerson had a comment, I think. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Member Cathcart. Let me find out a little bit more specific. I think the Council President's comments about showers and some of the other uh, capital improvements were correct. I want to make sure I get a complete list for you. That includes the actual cost. So give me a couple of days, and I'll have that information back to you. Council Member Wilkerson. Thank you, Council President. Uh, I certainly hear what the community is saying. But when you're in a facility that's ran 24 hours a day with a number of people uh, that are housed at different levels of abilities or disabilities, there will be wear and tear and there will be maintenance on that. And along with the increase in uh, wages for people who do that work, which is really difficult work. And so I think that they should be compensated fairly uh, there is a shortage of uh, workers across the board, but especially in this arena, uh, it's extremely challenging to find qualified help to care for the people that we're trying to care for. So I will be in support of this, but uh, I recognize that, but it is ongoing to maintain a building. Other council commentary? Yeah, I... So... I'm super happy. Council for a few years has been saying, please, let's not do seasonal sheltering. Let's do year-round sheltering. And we passed an ordinance last year to say you can't close shelters unless you have provided adequate beds, uh, the same type of beds before, um, or, or they're not needed anymore because people just aren't using them. So I like the idea that we're going to... Um, year-round shelter at this location. I think that's a big step forward. My sense, easy to say looking backwards, is this building probably wasn't the best and it was chosen more for its location because it's very isolated away from uh, neighborhoods and things like that. And I think it had more to do with that, which just to be clear, I'm pretty sure was purchased before this administration came in. Um, but uh, so I'm hoping that we can do that accounting so that we have a lesson Lesson learned so that when we look for our next shelter, because we're going to need another one at least, that we will um, choose a little more wisely on it and with a better unified plan. The, the other lesson on this is that we changed our mind about three times as a city what we were going to use this shelter for. So, uh, But I support us doing it, and it costs the real cost for sheltering is not really the buildings. It is the staffing 24-7. Uh, uh, security, food, uh, people being able to work in a challenging situation with a, a group of guests who have a lot of needs and need a lot of compassion. So I fully support spending the money on that. Uh, with that, let's have a roll call. Council Member Mum? Aye. Council Member Stratton? Aye. Council Member Kinnear? Aye. 
Council President Sinai, Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes six to zero. And we have another special budget ordinance. Ordinance C-36058, general fund from operating transfer in $14,592 to software maintenance, same amount, and fleet services fund from assistance, assistant direct, assistance director fleet services, $14,592 to operating transfer out, same amount. This action allows for the addition of a debt service leasing module to Simpro to track vehicle leases, 50% of which will be funded by fleet. All right. Pretty straightforward. No one from the community has asked to comment on it. Is there any council commentary? All right, we'll have a vote. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Oh, Council Presidents and I forgot myself. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes six to zero. And we have one more special budget ordinance. Ordinance C-36059, Water and Hydroelectric Services Fund from Unappropriated Reserves, $1,172,000 to construction of FA, same amount. This action allows for construction of a replacement employee parking lot following the sale of the Triangle Park property at the northeast corner of North Foothills in Nevada. We don't have any community comment on this. Do we have any council commentary? Council Member Mum. I was not a fan of this in the beginning because I thought it was a lot of money uh, and uh, we really don't provide parking for a lot of our employees, but this is a little bit of a special circumstance. And after a lot of discussion back and forth with uh, staff, the price came way down. There's going to be some improvements that will benefit the neighborhood. I actually grew up in that neighborhood and boy, could the street use some, some improvements. Uh, and it'll be right next to the new school. And I think it will help with parking, uh, which does improve the neighborhood in the area. And I also think we are investing in property that will improve the price of the property if for some day we actually don't use the property anymore. So it's a very old property. I think we've had it, what, a century perhaps? Um, so uh, I will support this. Any other council commentary? Council Member Stratton. Thank you, Councilmember Mum. I was feeling the same way, and I also grew up in that area. So, um, after much thought and much more information, um, I can support it now. But thank you for for your statement. Any other comments? I did not grow up in that neighborhood, but I had similar feelings. But I, I tell you, this week I, or last week, I was out there for the dedication of the new middle school. Uh, Denny Yasuhara Middle School. It was a very exciting event and moment, and his family uh, was there. And to see that neighborhood change, uh, all that housing for all those families are now up now, where that crazy dirt gravel lot where these employees used to. And the school's up, and this uh, kind of old, tired uh, water department kind of place is getting spruced up. So it really has changed. It's going to be amazing. So, um, and I really do appreciate um, all the work from our city staff to get, I think like the number was 1.7 million down. Now it's 1.1 million. And, and the Catholic Charities really paid for most of that uh, when they bought the tri um, Triangle property. So um, anyway, it turned out much better. And I really appreciate the collaboration with council and staff on that. And with that, let's have a roll call. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President and I. Council Member Cathcart. Nay. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay, that passed five to one. We're done with special budget ordinances, but we have an emergency ordinance. Ordinance C-36060, relating to the rates of water services, amending Spokane Municipal Code sections 13.04.0608.2022.2025.2026 and .2028 of the Chapter 13.04, declaring an emergency and setting an effective date. 
We did not have any requests for community commentary. This, this is mostly just a technical change. We updated our water rates last year, but there were a couple of sections where we didn't have the right cross references. So this cures that. Any council commentary? Let's have a vote. Council member Mum. Aye. Council member Stratton. Aye. <laughs> I think you could use the tail as a vote voting <laughs> tool. Council member Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. And we're moving to resolutions and final reading ordinances. Um, I'm going to take the. Well, maybe I don't care. There's no one signed up for. The, um, so we'll just go in order. Go ahead, Madam Clerk. Okay. Resolution 2021-29, approving the Plan Commission's 2021 work plan, plan, program deferred from April 26, 2021 agenda. And we did substitute the attachment today to uh, take into account uh, some of the infill and housing density uh, work that council anticipates uh, directing the administration to do in response to the housing action plan. So that's, those placeholders are there. And we discussed this afternoon that when we finalize our official response to the housing action plan and actually make it into a plan, uh, we'll, uh, if needed, we'll update this attachment as well in the same resolution. Um, any council commentary? Council Member Kinnear. Thank you. I'm a sponsor of this and the plan commission ladies on. Typically we would have approved this back in January, February at the latest. So I urge the council to give the plan commission and the planning department some certainty by passing this with the knowledge that we can make amendments or changes or additions as we go on and things come up. So it's not set in stone. It's just a guide that they can go uh, work off of so that they have a plan going forward. So I would urge passage of this um, and make life simpler for our, our planning people. Thank you. Council Member Cathcart and then Council Member Mum. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I am going to vote for this tonight. I uh, had some concerns, but based on how we have uh, updated the language in the work plan. Um, I, I think it's at least satisfactory for us to move forward. Uh, I appreciate that we've included the review of zoning and densities. I think that's something I've been pushing for quite a bit, and I'm glad that that's in there. And then also that we have a line item for council priorities coming out of the housing action plan. And um, I, I think there could be uh, likely to be some really good um, uh, items uh, coming from there as well. So based on the changes, the updates, uh, it's something that I can support tonight. Councilmember Mum. Yeah, I just want to thank all the plan commissioners who volunteer, volunteer their time to work on these projects for us. And then we work hand in hand with the administration who funds or works to fund staff to be assigned to these programs that we are prioritizing. And so we all have to work together on it. And with us not getting this done until the middle of the year, it has really put the brakes on our growth at the most important time that I can think of coming out of COVID. So the next quarterly meeting that we have with the plan commissioners, I hope all of you can attend and put forth some discussions on the points that have kept us from passing this to this time. And then we should draft as we typically do in our final quarterly meeting, what those priorities are going to look like and pass them in January. So make those decisions much earlier in the year. And that's what we have done over the last two decades. So I, I know COVID has interrupted a lot of this, but I hope we can get back to our regular pattern. And I also want to mention, even though it's not in there, I have heard, and I think uh, Councilmember Stratton has heard as well, from there are at least four neighborhoods who still have not had their neighborhood plans completed. And this is again, slowing down growth and they have the funding set aside. We can hire consultants to do this. And I still wanna have that conversation, even though it's not in our plan because most of the housing that was anticipated in our comprehensive plan was to be in the centers and corridors areas. 
So when we aren't building these out, and I've talked to Johnny Perkins, I think we're going to go for a drive and we're going to go look at all these to have a fuller understanding that we might be able to change some long-term codes, but what's down the road for zoning and that sort of thing, but what's going to really fire up this city and help solve the housing problem more quickly is where it's already allowed. So I look forward to having that discussion with the rest of you on the ARP funds and how we can um, put those toward rebuilding business areas, mixed use areas, office and housing in, in these centers. So I am so thankful that uh, we are going to have this up tonight and that we can finally pass it and give it to plan commission. So thanks for giving me the time. All right, uh, council member Cathcart. Yeah, just to be clear, I mean, we, this didn't come before us until February of this year. And we heard from our interim planning director that they had no capacity to really even work on additional items until the downtown plan and the housing action plan were completed. So I don't think we've hit the brakes, solved anything at all. In fact, I think the delay has made this a much better document and it's going to get us to a much better position as a city. Any other commentary? All right, let's have a vote. Council member Mum. Aye. Council member Stratton. Aye. Council member Kinnear. Aye. Council president is an aye. Council member Cathcart. Aye. Council member Wilkerson. Aye. All right. Another six to zero. Uh, all right. We're about to do a series of resolutions. Uh, essentially, they're going to be up or down votes uh, related to requests for property owners to join our Spokane retail water service area. So these are all properties that are outside our, our retail water service area, but for a variety of reasons, people would like to be in it. Some of them are in the urban growth area and some of them are not. Uh, we're going to have Eldon Brown. Just We're going to do them one at a time, Eldon, and we'll just have you present it real briefly. We've talked about it numerous times in committees, so I think council members are familiar, and nobody from the public has asked to um, testify. So I feel like we can go through it pretty quickly. But So Eldon, the first one is uh, 36, and I think you have the parcel numbers, but 9042, 43, and 44. You know, I'll see if I can. Did you want uh, me to read it first? Uh, oh, Good sorry, evening, Council President. I, Eldon, I'm sorry, I forgot to have uh, Ms. Fister read the title of it. Then I'll then I'll invite you. Go ahead. <laughs> Resolution 2020. Right. Oh, excuse me. Resolution 2021-36 relating to modification of the City of Spokane's retail water service area to include parcel numbers 35, 354.9042, 9043, and 9044, deferred from April 26, 2021 agenda. All right. Okay, can you see that screen there? Yep. Okay, we'll start off with, uh, let's see here. Just a map of the overall area. Can you make it bigger, Eldon? You need it bigger? Yeah. If possible. <laughs> He'll probably zoom in when we get closer. If I can pull it over here a little bit. You can also do that on your screen, Lori. You can. I know. I, I know. I got it up to 200% on mine. I was getting to where you can hardly read it. So. Okay. Yeah, I know. All right. <laughs> Better than it was. Thank you. I'll just go back to this map to start off with. And the first resolution is. 2021-0036, the applicant in this particular proposal on here, in fact, let me back up here. We did receive 11 applications total out here. What we look at when we receive them is the duty to provide water service. And we look at four items in that regard. And I'll pull our map up here for that. So basically what we look at is, is water available in a timely and reasonable manner? We have sufficient water rights available? Do we have sufficient capacity to serve? And are they consistent with the requirements of local plans and regulations? Those are the four things we evaluate them on. So in that, uh, let me get back to our map here. I can pull up the parcels here. <coughs> okay. 
Okay, the very first one. Is out off 37th Avenue, just off 37th, east of Glen Rose. This applicant wants to build a facility to provide public parks and recreation services out there. When we went through our map, and I'll bring it back up here again. On this one, I'll put my pointer up here going across there. That particular location complied with three of our four criteria on there. It is outside the UGA. On here. That's one of them that when we look at that scenario, we look at the comp plan. So we did go through the comp plan, basically the capital facilities and utilities, which is CFU 3.6. We did find in there that there is one application that this thing looks like it might comply with when it's outside the UGA. And we do look at the exceptions in that comp plan for providing water service outside the UGA. This one here, when it actually has the ability to provide service to uh, public services out there, that is one item that does comply with CFU 3.6 B2.C on here. There's an item in there that addresses that. And so we recommend approval of this application based on it complying with that actual application. The actual uh, water main is about, I'll go back to our map here, Water main is basically just south of the, the purple parcels on there, so the main would have to be extended about 1.5 feet to get it to where it fronts these three parcels. And that would be, of course, done by the applicant on there to do that. But uh, those are the criteria we evaluated this proposal on. It fully complies with everything except being outside the UGA, and we did find one application that looks like it applied to this particular situation. So we did recommend approval based on that. Be happy to answer any further questions to it. Council. Yeah. Thanks, Eldon. Um, this is a, it, yes, they're going to be providing parks and, and recreation, but it is a, a private entity. It's not public per se. So That's you have true. to be a member, <clears throat> excuse me, a member in order to use this. And so I just want to make sure that everybody understands this. It's not for anybody's use. It's not actually, true. I think it is intended to be actually for uh, the county parks use. I don't think it is privately uh, that you have to have <laughs> private membership to get into it. I think they provide some services to the county parks department for, you know, probably various types of park and recreation services. Um, I'm not sure that it's correct that it actually you have to be a member to do that. I don't know that for sure though. Um, I do. It's it's pretty limited and and. Um, so I, I would say that that may not apply in this case. When you say parks, I'm going to take issue with that. Um, and it is outside the UGA, which I also have an issue with. I also know that the Glen Rose community not happy about this based on the amount of traffic it would bring to the area. And they're not really set up for this. Um, it's in a outside area and so with any kind of recreation there's going to be lights and nighttime activities so I just want council to think about that when they're contemplating approving this council member any other questions council member mom yeah first of all I think Eldon has one of the most thankless jobs ever and he <laughs> always comes to our meetings and he stays till the very end and Eldon you are fabulous I mean you just you just do and to that end I hope in the future we don't put you in a position of whether you recommend we approve or not, because I don't want to get in a discussion or debate with you. Um, <laughs> because one of the things in, and Eldon knows this, I was on the team that helped write 3.6. <laughs> and so I have a lot of history with this. Just because it might technically comply does not mean that the council has to do it 
or wants to do it or needs to do it. So I want to say that up front. And you're doing your job, Elton. You're doing a good job. <laughs> but I really don't like to see you put on point of whether you recommend or not. But, you know, that, that's up to you guys. But I am not going to support this because I don't think it's necessarily timely and reasonable. I don't think we have the infrastructure to facilitate uh, this, as, as those in the neighborhood know, it's not easy to get to this location, and it would probably dramatically change some traffic patterns. And I think with it being outside the UGA, uh, we need facilities like this that have full services. And so 3.6 um, has been uh, bandied about for a long time, but it just doesn't meet the, the level of um, need for us to include this in the water service area at this time. And I'm happy to discuss 3.6 further with anyone who would like to, if it's very technical. <laughs> and I do just want to say too, I'm just rec recommending this purely based on the water service perspective. Just so you're aware, that's what I'm trying to do. So. Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, <clears throat> this is one I'm actually a bit conflicted on. Uh, I, I believe that in three or four years, this is going to be added into the urban growth boundary. We're going to see a lot of housing go into this area. And so I'm, I'm conflicted because saying no enables that housing to be built. Saying yes enables a sports facility that our region really, really needs uh, will, uh, will allow that to get built. So it's very conflicting to me. But ultimately, I, I don't see inherent uh, concern with the facility proposed. And I don't think I should judge the decision based on the applicants. And so I'm going to support this tonight, but I do think that this would be a ripe area for housing in three or four years when it does get incorporated into the UGA, quite likely to get incorporated. Um, and so I guess we'll see based on this vote tonight what the next steps are. And Councilmember Wilkerson, I can't see you in the current camera view. So if you have any comments, feel free. Hi, thank you, Council President. I will not be supporting this. One, it is outside the growth management, but uh, that area is not developed yet. I run that strip frequently, um, multiple times a week, and I just don't see it ready for prime time at this point. In the next year or two, or whatever they come back to us with, I know the council will take that under full consideration, but as of tonight, I'll be voting no. All right. Thank you. And now I can't see you, Council Member Stratton, if you have any comments. Not hearing any. Um, I am also concerned it's outside the UGA, uh, but I also share Council Member Cathcart's concern that it might be in a few years. And so the opportunity to um, lock up some open space in what might be subdivision land is uh, appealing to me. but. We don't really have a process for doing that. And uh, we've been discussing having a little more process around this. And I think the water department would like a little more. And I know I would and uh, others uh, for all different reasons. But I would like to see if we, if we do come up with a process that we have a, a process for people that if they're outside the UGA, one, they know that it's very unlikely that they're going to be approved. Uh, unless they enter into some kind of long t um, permanent easement that will keep the space open. And I think there could be a win for that. Um, there's a few of these that we're going to hear tonight where people uh, want to put one house on five acres. And if they were willing to put an easement to say that would always be there, then we'd have at least a five acre island there of open space uh, once the subdivisions get approved there. But I don't think it's really fair to just do it on a one-off basis, and we just need to incorporate that into our system, that if that's what you want to pursue, you do that from the beginning, and so it's very uniform, uh, and then we can look at it in those terms. So I'm hoping we'll do that. But for now, I'm not supporting this, And um, uh, but I think everyone's had a chance to comment who wanted to, so let's have a vote. Um, Council Member Mum. Nay. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Nay. Council President's a nay. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Nay. 
Okay, so it looks like that fails two to four. And we'll have Ms. Fister read the next one, and then we'll have Eldon. Okay. Resolution 2021-37 relating to modification of the City of Spokane's retail water service area to include Spokane County parcel numbers 262-12.9098.9079.9087.9080.9081.0409.0116.0103.0104.3526.9141 and authorizing amendment of the city's real retail water service area map on file with Washington State Department of Health. Okay, Eldon, summarize this one for us. Yeah, the second set here are the seven applications that we received that were inside the UGA boundary. I'll just pull up a kind of a sample. This is out in the West Plains area where we had like five of them here. It's around Spotted Road south of I-90. They're all within the UGA boundary out there. So it's just a matter of extending utilities to the site, which would be done by the developers. So this one met all four of our criteria in there for providing water service to it. So, but again, we did one resolution to include all these seven parcels. And if you want to look at each of the parcels separately on there, I'd be happy to answer any questions about them. All right. I don't want to, but if anyone else does, you can tell us. All right. Any? There are, uh, there are, there are two other ones. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I'm showing here one of them. Yep. One of them is in city limits. And, uh, there are two of them, excuse me, they're not in the city limits, but they're one of them is around Point Ninth Avenue in the Havana area, and the other one's around Indian Trail. And two other individual parcels. I'd be happy to pull them up if you want to look at them. Why don't you pull them up? Okay. This is one off Nine Mile Road, and here this is inside the Urban Growth Boundary. Individual has an existing house adjacent to this parcel and he just wants to connect to a water main that's in Nine Mile Road and build on this existing parcel. But it is inside the Urban Growth Boundary. Councilmember Kinnear. And the other one, I think. Councilmember Kinnear has a question. The other one. Yeah. Uh, so just so we're clear, just because you say you're going to build a house on a parcel, this gentleman's saying he's going to build one house on this entire piece of property. There's nothing saying that he has to do that. He is free to change his mind, correct? Absolutely. He could do a plan in there and there again that would be a, allowable because he's inside the growth boundary, but we would have to comment on that plat if we could tell the service right. too. So I just want to make sure everybody's aware that just because someone says they're going to build one house or they're going to put X, Y, or Z on a parcel or a piece of property, they're not required to do so. That's correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. In the last parcel, we had. Kind of happy with my trigger finger there. This is the last one that's inside the urban growth boundary. And it's out there east of Havana Street, just on the north side of 29th. This particular individual does want to do a, a plant in here to actually develop that, what you see in purple. But he is inside the growth boundary. He would have to extend water service. Would come from possibly two directions. You can see up here to the north or coming off 29th Avenue to the south. But that would all be addressed as part of the planning process. So he does meet all our criteria as far as being able to provide utility service to it anyway. Okay. Councilmember Any questions on, on this batch? Yeah, I know it's interesting to see all these little ones all clustered around the city, but I have no heartburn over this. It's what the whole um, CFU 3.6 was intended to do. This is an urban or planned urban area that has been calculated um, under our Growth Management Act and Spokane County planning principles to absorb for this kind of housing. And it doesn't 
uh, wreck the other plans. It's very consistent, so I'm happy to support it. And I also want to thank Councilmember Kinnear for bringing up that point. Uh, it is what is runs with the land and what is the zoning. It's not, you know, I'm sure every person who comes forward and tells us they're only going to use it for this, that's exactly how they believe it at that time. But things do change over time, and this is a commitment forever. So we have to see, when we make these decisions, what would this look like at maximum build out? And, and how does that impact everything else and all the other plans that we have? So I will be supporting this. Okay. Any other council, Any other questions? council commentary? Uh, this is Karen. I have a question. Yeah. So um, first you're going to be proud of me because I've attended all of these, all of the briefings and I have all my notes. <laughs> um, because it, it gets confusing. But I guess what I'd like to know, Elvin, when you say we looked at this and, and staff recommends approval, what does that mean? This, what we're doing is recommending that we met all the criteria from the city perspective as a duty to provide water service. Okay. It doesn't mean any more than that. That's, on there. It's, okay. Okay. Thank you. I mean, we, we found some means in there, even on the further outside the urban growth boundary, we found an exception in that comprehensive plan that would allow that to take place. That's basically all we're saying in here. We okay. found a, so it's not as much a recommendation, I guess, of actually just finding the means through our uh, policies and procedures on here, which would allow it to take place. Okay. That's what I'm talking okay. About. We, Thank you. We kind of in the in the law we call that a prima facie case, which means they have an argument to make. It doesn't mean that they've done it. Yes, Councilmember Kinnear. Yeah. This has nothing to do with uh, water. Is there a way we could get rid of the echo? It's it's hard to hear. All right, I don't know where the echo's coming from. I've got my now it's gone. Oh no, it's back. Okay. Apparently, it is me, so yeah. I will be more careful. Um, <laughs> any okay. other commentary on th this? So we, I asked Eldon to group these together because they're all in the UGA, and they meet all the criteria. So um, I, and I put the ones that didn't meet in the UGA um, separately. But any more commentary about this one before we vote on this package? Okay. Then we'll have a vote. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, as I raise with the Council President prior to the meeting, I have to abstain on this vote. Okay. And Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay. That passes five to zero with one abstention. All right, we are to uh, resolution 38. Resolution 2021-38 relating to modification of the city of Spokane's retail water service area to include parcel number 26231.9207. All right, Eldon, tell us about this one. Yeah, this is another one here that met, I'll pull up our little map here again. I go across here, it complies with three of our criteria, but it is outside the UGA. And there again, we started looking for something inside CFU 3.6 where this one might qualify. The one we kind of looked at in this regard was the one that uh, well, the water main was actually built adjacent to that site in uh, June of 2000, and I think it needed to be there prior to May 31st of 2001. So it actually complied with that, an exception that we found in the CFU 3.6. And so from that basis on there, plus it also is adjacent to the water main in there where they're just putting a service connection into it. But uh, that was primarily why we found a means to move this one forward with kind of a recommendation that it could actually uh, apply with our regulations and it could actually be constructed based on our reg exceptions to the rules. Let's put it that way. Now this one here, just a little history on the background of that parcel. Let me go back to it here. Uh, 
Elvin, oh. isn't this the same one we reviewed last year? Is it any different? Because we were all here. So, uh, yeah, no. Well, it was a couple of years ago, but yes. It's well, it was a couple of years ago. I thought it was right. last year. <laughs> <laughs> so back in 18, I think it was a parcel, just some history to it. On there, what you see in purple in there was used to include this little area in green down there. The city actually purchased that piece of that site to put a booster station in there that provides water service to our Kip tank to the north. And so as part of that sale in there, and I talked to our real estate folks in here that actually uh, purchased that property, and they kind of felt like at some point in time there had been a representation at least that uh, somebody could certainly tie in from that parcel into our water main once we purchased this thing from it. It's not in writing. I don't have any of that that I have in writing, but uh, that was just uh, some commentary that came forth on this particular parcel. And again, they want to build one house on the rest of this parcel on here and tie it into that water main. Now, one thing I would like to add on our resolutions that we did put in here is we are getting real specific on a resolution when you're outside that UGA boundary. We would hold somebody to that one house on that thing. If it did get approved and somebody comes in later and gets uh, put into where they're inside the UGA boundary or whatever, they'd have to modify, in my mind, our resolution to be able to develop more than the one house because we got real specific to it. So. I just wanted to throw that out for some commentary to it. Yeah. yeah. Can I comment on that? Because it's outside the NGA, it's also outside the city. So we really have no control over whether they build one or 100 houses unless we incorporate that area inside the UGA. But they could do anything they want until we do that. We're, we don't well, have control. I think if we actually restricted that by the resolution that says, okay, we put you in the, UG, in the retail water service boundary based on building one house on that thing, I think we could actually hold to that. So you're saying that we could cut off the, we could turn off the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying they'd have to go through, number one, before they could build more than one house, they'd have to go through a county platting process like you're talking about to be able to do that. And they couldn't do that until they get put in the UGA. So in my mind, if these things get approved in the scenario like we're talking about, they're really limited to that building that one house on this thing. That would be my take to it anyway. Councilmember Mum. Eldon, is this application any different from the one we rejected previously? No. Thank you. Just providing us more information to it, but nothing different to it. Because we've had this debate before. Thank you. Yes, we did. Yep. Any other questions, Councilmember Council Member Stratton. Okay, so I've got to make sure I understand this one. So the purple, the highlighted purple area, that's the land we're talking about, right? Yep. And that's where they want to build one home, right? Yep. yep. That connection is right there, just a little bit outside of that purple area. Right. They would just tie into that water main that's right adjacent to it. That's already there. Yep. And do they pay more for water, hooking it up like that? Do they pay regular water rates or do they pay more because they're outside? I'd have to look at the latest rates, but I think they're a little higher when you're outside the actual city they limits. Sort of water rates. You are going to be a little higher, yeah. I don't remember okay. exactly what the rate is. but uh, Okay. That's all I want. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Any other comments? Then let's have a vote. Council Member Mum. Nay. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Nay. Council President Sinead. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay. So it doesn't doesn't it get a majority. So it's three to three. It fails for tonight. Okay. Next one, Madam Clerk. Resolution 2021-39 relating to modification of the City of Spokane's retail water service area to include parcel number 26142.9021. All right, Eldon. Okay, this one is yeah, this one is just north of our Kemp water tank. It's a 10-acre parcel. It's a farm up there. People have a beef farm and livestock. 
the applicants on this one haul water from, I think they have a house inside the city limits and they actually haul water to that site to run their farm operation today. So they did actually try to drill a well on that site, went down 200 some feet, didn't hit water. They also tried to check with two of our neighbors, Delview Water District and Whitworth, and neither one of them were interested in trying to provide water service to them. We're the most immediately adjacent one to it. And they did actually get a letter of support from the Washington State Department of Health on this one, and that's another criteria that's in our CFU 3.6, that from a safety and health perspective on running that farm, why they were supported by this letter from, I could say, the Department of Health on here. So that's basically what's going on with that one. Be happy to answer any questions. Councilmember Kinnear. Elvin, we did this one before too, right? Nope, we didn't, didn't do this one. We did one close to it, but not this particular oh, okay. site. Oh, okay. I, I seem to remember the bee farm and the livestock. And so, okay. Um, there was one right adjacent to it. We did do there at one but, time. So when they bought this, it didn't have water on it. So they were choosing to farm. They weren't do, isn't this dry land farming? Somebody who's familiar with that. Uh, is this dry land farming? So it seems odd that you'd buy a farm knowing it's dry land and then grow things that require water. So that's a little inconsistent for me, and it is outside the UGA. Um, okay, thank you. Councilmember Mum. So, yeah, thanks for reminding me about that one, uh, Councilmember Kinnear. There was one very close to this that was also turned down because we have thousands of lots next to water mains, thousands and thousands. And so if you use that as the criteria to expand, you will continue to do that in the city where you'll just mushroom. And so that's why CFU um, 3.6 was put in with very, very narrow criteria and as you can see, it's surrounded by other rural lots. And um, if you give one, it's gonna be really hard not to say no. I'm concerned, you know, if we do approve something like this, we will have hundreds or more of people saying, hey, you did it for these people. I'm only gonna put in one house for right now. Um, so I think we, that's why we have these policies. So I'm gonna support the policy. I'm gonna support all the work that's been done on urban growth area, inside and outside, and I'm going to have to stick with what we've done in the past, which is say, no, not right now. Other commentary? All right, I'll just kind of repeat just because I, I think this is, again, a good example of one where if we had a process, they could just um, put a conservation easement on it and farm to their heart's delight and we'd have that open space and, and agriculture when uh, the urban growth area catches up to it. But we don't have that yet, so hopefully by next year, maybe we'll have that in place. Um, we'll go to a roll call. Councilmember Mum. I know this is hard votes. I, or that's a name. No, it's a day. Sorry. Okay. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Nay. Council President Sine. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Nay. Okay. That one fails two to four. Um, Ms. Fister. Resolution 2021-40 relating to modification of the City of Spokane's retail water service area to include parcel number 26133.0272. All right, Eldon, I think this is the last one. Yeah. Okay, this one here is another one up in the five mile area. It's uh, north of uh, Johansson. This is Hawthorne Road that comes right into this site from the west. So it's east of Five Mile Road, and it's a 14 and a half acre parcel. This is one in here that's uh, an individual there again wants to build one house on this site. And uh, what we could find in our CFU 3.6 and address this one is it's right adjacent to the UGA boundary. And that's one of the criteria that uh, would allow this one to actually be approved and be in compliance with that, that policy. But that's what the individual put on his actual application is he wanted to build one house 
I don't know if the intent was truly to stop that road from going through, because this is a, on Hawthorne, is a road that comes right into the site on here. But there again, uh, we have no control over what an applicant might do down the line. Just in my mind, if these got approved when they come in here and say they want to build one house, I think we would flat out just uh, restrict them to building one house as part of our approval to get put inside the retail water boundary. And as they went through later on, if they get put in a UGA or something where they can get higher densities on there, I think they'd still have to modify our original resolution to be able to do that. But uh, that's just me talking. I'm not on the lawyer end. So. But anyway, that's what, uh, what they're proposing on this one. Councilmember Mum. So this is uh, just east of Jesse's Bluff, right? Yes. And that was one of those big controversial uh, plats that happened oh so long ago. And right. as you can see, that's a UGA island, right? Mm -hmm. So some of you may remember the fight that happened with Spokane County and FutureWise over these UGA islands. Um, so I don't actually consider this a connected UGA, uh, and you know there's a freeze right now. Uh, there's so much history to this. I can't. It's it's not worth bringing up. But I will not be supporting this. Uh, certainly not because it's next to this strange UGA, which, as you can see, does not even include the whole plat. It's just a very small piece of it, um, and it was carved out for whatever reason uh, when they were doing it. But it's it's. A uh, decision by the county that was made, and I don't think the city should exacerbate the problem here. So uh, until this all gets sorted out and some um, more seamless planning happens here, I think we should back off. I'm not going to support adding water at this time. All right. Any other commentary? Councilmember Stratton and then Councilmember Cathcart. I just have a question, Councilmember Mom. So at what point will it get sorted out? Do we know? Yeah, as soon as um, there's some changes at the county level. So um, the uh, growth management hearings boards uh, reversed some of those decisions. And again, there were multiple parcels that were involved. Uh, and so what, what should happen is the UGA should be all connected, not, sorry, I got someone calling me. Um, and so you, you shouldn't do sort of this hopscotch uh, Zoning in a way. Um, you want me to, I'll pull this one back a little bit. I can probably pull just that UGA boundary up so you can see it if you want me to do that. Is it in the yellow? Yeah, I, I'll just go ahead and get rid of those other two boundaries so you can see it there. So 2023. Okay, if I go through here and. Uh, I should just have a UGA boundary up there to now. So like you say, it is kind of isolated up there. You can just see the yellow, and it's not connected all the way through. I want you to be able to see that, just the UGA boundary by itself. Can you explain to me where the future service area? The future service area is in the blue. And there, the green is a retail water service boundary, and you can see the blue that kind of goes outside the green. So this is uh, in the blue. The blue goes right across the top of that purple right there, but it is outside the green, which you can kind of see borders right around that parcel. And isn't the future service area basically almost all of Spokane County? Most yeah. of it. Basically, what you can see in blue in there, all of that blue is in there. If I go in, I can go in there and get rid of it again, and you see the blue. But you're right; it's a much bigger boundary, of course, than anything else we have. But it's, there's still a lot of area that's outside the future service boundary too, where we butt up to the other utility purveyors and stuff. So there's a lot of active farmland still in that area. Anyway, that's what the applicant put on that one was we wanted to build this one house. So. Okay. All right. Any okay. other? And hold on. Go ahead. Can I ask one more question? Yes. So 
Eldon, I know you're so proud of me here because I like, I'm reading up the notes. Um, on my notes from the last briefing, I wrote down on this one, um, water evaluation. Do we have any idea what I was writing that down for? Well, only thing I was just going to add in here was uh, when the guy says one on here, I think it's one unit per five acres up there. I think somebody could almost get three out of this one, even though he says he wants to build one. Because I think it's in the zoning up there would allow one unit per five acres in this particular one. Yeah, comes by the bottom. It's actually one for twenty. This is rural. Oh, this is one twenty in this area here. It is one for twenty. Okay. Well, then, then they would be stuck for that one out. Son. They can do clusters. But this is this is what's tough because this area, the other two that we looked at too, that's a rural area, and these islands were put in from a county commissioner decision 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. But so what you're saying is only one house on this this acreage, right? That is that we're talking about the 14 acres. Based on the zoning it's there today, it sounds like only one house could go in there until. Yeah. They can cluster and put up to five if they put the houses really close together instead of like carving it up into five acre lots. But there's no infrastructure because it's rural. They do have in Hawthorne Road, I didn't show it on there, but there is sewer and water that comes right to that parcel mm -hmm. coming from, through the Jesse's Bluff plat that you're talking about. So, so uh, let me just comment. So I, I think right now there's a, a retail water service area island in itself, uh, and allowing this to enter the retail water service area would fix that problem. Um, and frankly, this is probably an area that, again, is going to be included in, in an urban growth expansion in the future. No, no, I disagree with you on that, Michael. I've lived up here 30 years, and it's too expensive, and I would never make a decision based on that. I totally disagree. But it's contiguous with other residential areas, and I, I it's, it, it, you don't have the history that I do on this. You're gonna have to trust me on this. Well, right. I, I think one house. Hey, based folks, on that what, open wish. Hey, there's two, there, there's everyone, two stop just like one at a time, please. Let's have one at a time. <laughs> All right. Anyway, I'm. That concludes my comment. Okay. Anything more, Councilmember Rum? Okay. Anything from anyone else? All right, we'll have a vote. Councilmember Mum. Nay. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Nay. Council President's a nay. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. I'm gonna trust Councilmember Mum and go nay. All right. All right, that doesn't pass two to four. All right, Eldon, thank you um, for uh, your staying with us. Uh, this has been a long process and making it clear for us, appreciate that. And again, I'm hoping we can work with you and Ms. Shadle maybe for the next round to um, come up with a, a, a few more things that I think will make it, are designed to make it easier for the applicant I, I th that's really my main concern is that the applicant has a good understanding of what's likely to happen so they don't invest too much time and lawyers and things like that. Uh, Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. I, Eldon brought this up uh, last year, I think when the water service, retail service area was first brought forward. Uh, and that was this idea of some sort of a, a ordinance to just simply make anything that's inside the urban growth boundary part of the water service area. And so uh, to me, something like that would make sense uh, for us to do. That would save Eldon a lot of time and, and effort and allow us to focus on just ones that are probably a little bit more controversial. Yep. Yep. I think that could be part of a whole update of that process, certainly considered for sure. Yeah. If you have some language on these, but some stuff there that you'd like us to look at too, if you'd send that to us, we certainly see what we could do with that. Yeah. I'm happy to work on that with Councilmember Kinnear, who's the liaison to the Planning Commission for that. Okay. All right. Any other commentary? Thank you. Thank you, Eldon. I don't think you have anything else, so I hope you can turn off your computer and enjoy the rest <laughs> of your evening. Um, okay. All right. That brings us, we've got some airport resolutions. 
Resolution 2021-42, joint resolution with Spokane County in the matter of authorizing Spokane Airport Board to sell property located on a portion of Spokane County Assessor Parcel Number 25295.9050, comprising 4.46 acres of land at Spokane International Airport. We were briefed on this earlier today. We have some land to sell to businesses that are um, establishing themselves in the airport corridor. Any, uh, there's no community comment. Any uh, council commentary? Councilmember Wilkerson. Uh, I'm excited for this, uh, activating that land out by the airport uh, for business growth and economic development. So I will be supporting them. Any other council commentary? All right. Let's have a vote. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. I probably should have done these together, so apologies for that. But if you would read the next one. Resolution 2021-43, joint resolution with Spokane County in the matter of authorizing the Spokane Airport Board to sell property located on a portion of Spokane County Assessor Parcel Number 25335.9056, comprised of 20 acres of land at Spokane International Airport. All right, same situation, different buyers, and no community comment. Any further council commentary? Seeing none, we'll have a vote. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Tanai. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. Okay. That passes six to zero. And I'm going to have Ms. Fister read the next one while I close the shade on the window. Resolution 2021-44, designating City of Spokane as Hooptown, USA. All right. Well, I'm particularly fond of this one because I've played in Hoop Fest quite a bit. Uh, is there any council commentary? All right. Council, we'll go to a vote. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. All right. Council President and I. Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. And Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. That passes six to zero. We have another resolution that we substituted language on. If you'd like to read the caption. Resolution 2021-45, establishing the framework guiding principles and timeline for the deployment of funds received from the Federal American Rescue Plan Act. All right, we don't have any community comment. Uh, this is our kickoff of a process to collect ideas from the community and have council prioritize them and then we have some new software called Thought Exchange where we can um, engage the community further. And then we're establishing a, a recovery work group with the mayor's office so that we can work closely with the administration on implementation plans and partnerships, perhaps with the school district and the county, uh, and really get the most out of this amazing amount of money, $40.5 million right now and another $40.5 million in May. Um, so this sets that out. But any council uh, commentary? Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, I am going to support this tonight. I'm just grateful that we were able to update the language to um, put more of an implementation role for that work group and allow the full council to have more input into the upfront uh, investments. So thank you for that. Yep. We heard you. Uh, any other commentary people have? Councilmember Wilkerson. I will be supporting this also, but I'm excited for what Councilman Catcart said, but also for our commitment to involve the community 
in the decision making process of these funds for our city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. Anything further? Councilmember Mum. I was also glad to hear that the mayor and her staff are willing to bring forward what they hear in the community, even though it is up to us. And we do set the policy and the budget, but I appreciate that um, you know the mayor's side will also be participating in giving us some feedback before we make our decision. Anything further? City Administrator Perkins. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Council Members. Just wanted to reiterate what Council Member Mum just said. The mayor is very excited. The administration is looking forward to participating in this very open process making sure that we hear from all communities, uh, all businesses, all residents as it relates to the disbursement of the ARP funds. This is a great opportunity, exciting moment for Spokane, and we want to take full advantage of working uh, with you, Council President, the Council, and more importantly, the community, or as important, the community, to make sure that these funds are really distributed in the appropriate and mindful manner of, of all of our residents and businesses, and the mayor is in full support of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, it's time to go to a vote. Council Member Mum. Aye. Council Member Stratton. Aye. Council Member Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai. Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. Okay. That passes six to zero. And we have another resolution. Resolution 2021-46, using power agreement financial benefits from the waste to energy plant to plan for a transition to less carbon intensive waste management strategies. All right, there's no community comment on this. Um, This was a um, resolution. Council supported our uh, waste to energy plant getting a ruling from the Utilities Transportation Commission that a Vista could buy power from us uh, as we burn garbage from longer than five-year terms. And by doing so, we'll get more revenue than a five-year term. But we made it clear that we're looking for that extra revenue to finance the transition away from burning garbage because of its uh, greenhouse gas components. And now under new laws in Washington, we're gonna have to start paying penalties for that. So this will use that money uh, to make that transition, make it a little easier on ratepayers. Um, so this just supports that. We've already filed it with an outside lawyer. Uh, there's no community comment, as I mentioned, but is there any council commentary? All right, we'll have a vote. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council President Sinai, Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes six to zero. Okay, another resolution. Resolution 2021-47, setting a hearing before the City Council for June 28, 2021, regarding modification of the functions, activities, and or transportation programs and improvements of the Spokane Transportation Benefit District. All right, this is an update for, unless you're really a transportation nerd, you're probably not going to notice too much of it, but essentially... We collect money from um, car tabs for residential street projects. Uh, We don't have many funds for residential street projects, so it's really important. What we really want to do is make sure that we've got more uh, people in the public engaged in it from the neighborhoods, um, from the bike, uh, bicycle advisory board and other similar kinds of boards and plans and that we're really working all together on that. So just updates that, uh, makes it a little smoother now that we have a... um, Uh, initiative manager for um, transportation and neighborhood connectivity, Shauna Harshman. She and folks like John Dietzman helped put this together. Um, They'll keep things going better in the future. And really, again, more transparency and engagement for those community members who want to engage in transportation funding. Is there any council commentary? All right. Council member Mum. 
A, a vote. Yep. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I, Council Member Cathcart. Aye. Council Member Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes six to zero. Uh, we have a resolution that we added to tonight's agenda about watering on even and odd days and between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And then we also have a ordinance that we advanced from next week's agenda. If you'd like to read the next one, convenient to you, Ms. Fister. Okay. Resolution number 2021-0050, and this was advanced to, from the advance agenda next week to this tonight's agenda. A resolution terminating the local emergency declared in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and any associated emergency ordinances such as hiring freezes, freezes on contracting, for needed city projects and expenditure and limitations beyond the normal fiscal processes and procedures and expressing council's desire to immediately commence swift and strong recovery efforts efforts. Okay. So seems like a long evening and it's been a long year. Uh, we did that emergency declaration um, quite a while ago, but we've been talking about it and feeling like, Hey, we, we can get beyond that and we can get fully into recovery. So that would essentially end the mayor's um, emergency powers uh, short of, fi of declaring a new emergency if that were to come to pass. Um, no community comment. Uh, any of the sponsors want to say anything? Or have we worn you out? <laughs> Almost, not quite. Uh, I'm just excited that the city is part of the recovery process going forward. That was the whole intention of this. As the community gets back uh, on the road, the city needs to be right there uh, walking beside our partners uh, to, to do the best we can and to help the recovery of the economy. Any other comment? All right. Well, again, it's been a long road together, and I'm glad we're coming out of it and all the work. Can't tell you how many COVID recovery meetings I've been to, it seems like, in the last year, always early in the morning, and I've seen many of you there as well. Um, all right. We'll have a, a roll call. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I, Councilmember Cathcart. Aye. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right, that passes six to zero. One more resolution for tonight. Okay. And this one I'll read in its in its entirety. Resolution number 2021-51, a resolution encouraging the citizens and businesses within the city of Spokane to adjust watering patterns to every other day, whereas water stewardship is critical to protect our community's water supply, both in the Spokane Valley, Rathrum, Prairie, Aquifer, and in the Spokane River, and whereas approximately one half of the city's water is used for watering landscapes, and whereas the city of Spokane has promoted water stewardship and con conservation education efforts for more than a decade, focusing on the demand side of the city's water system. Whereas the city's water department also continues to implement operational and maintenance changes, including efforts to reduce distribution system loss and increase pumping efficiency. And whereas in 2020, the Spokane City Council adopted a water conservation master plan as proposed by the water department. And whereas this master plan focuses on taking the next steps towards water conservation efforts, recognizing the need to both shave the peak and shave the base of water use. And whereas the city's public works division has embraced a water stewardship strategic initiative designed to support the master plan and reduce water use over time. And whereas the city council's water resources conservation group is filled with many experts and citizens committed to water conservation and is committed to similar water conservation goals. And whereas the Washington State Department of Ecology recently declared a drought in much of the state of Washington, including the city of Spokane, and whereas in every other day, odd even schedule encourages residents located at odd numbered addresses to irrigate their landscapes on odd numbered days, while residents located at even numbered addresses irrigate, irrigate their landscapes on even numbered days. And whereas the odd even watering schedule 
provides a strategy for citizens to keep their water costs more affordable, especially taking into account recent changes to the residential water use tier structure and anticipated changes to the commercial water use tier structure. And whereas this watering pattern supports landscape health, allows turf and other plants to develop stronger deep root systems that make them more resilient during hot summer weather and extreme weather events. And whereas odd even watering schedules also help reduce summertime peak usage of water, are protective of the city's major water resources and supports a long-term goal of mitigating costly system improvements in the city's water system over time. And whereas the odd even schedule also works in concert with other water recommendations that support lower water use, including watering between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. rather than in the hottest part of the day. And whereas the city's Parks and Recreation Department has agreed to serve as an example of odd even watering approach with a focus on reducing waters in ways that have a minimal impact to park users' experience. And whereas Parks and Public Works are undertaking an agreement that will allow for annual investments in water saving and water conservation projects in parks in return for parks' commitment to every other day odd even or other watering strategies that maintain quality of plastic at sports fields, golf, while reducing park strain on the city's water system. And whereas the mayor of Spokane has requested that residents use the odd even watering schedule and choose to water between 6 p.m. and 10 a.m. And whereas the mayor of Spokane has requested that city council pass a resolution in support of her requests. And whereas achieving greater water conservation and stewardship in Spokane requires action at all levels, individual, family, neighborhood, community, local, regional, businesses, and utilities. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the city of Spokane is encouraging citizens and businesses to voluntarily adopt an every other day odd even watering schedule between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. to help protect water resources, maintain affordable water rates, support landscaping health, and reduce the need for costly water system expansions over time. Be it further resolved that significant benefits can be achieved if residents located at odd numbered addresses irrigate their landscapes on odd numbered days between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., while residents located at even numbered addresses irrigate their landscapes on even numbered days, reducing overall demand on a daily basis. Be it further resolved that the city will endeavor to lead as an example of odd even watering schedules for city owned and managed properties, including parks, and will continue to invest in automated watering systems that can direct watering between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. All right, we don't have any community comment. I want to commend the mayor for uh, encouraging community members, water users to conserve and asking council to join her in that request uh, to people. I do have to say, I've finally got my a watering system back up, which is always a, a pain every year after all the damage in the winter. And I found out that I can't really do it on the odd even day because it's by the day of the week. I can still do it every other day. Uh, so it's just kind of a point I really want to make to people is it's not so much doing it exactly right, but just being mindful and, and doing it however. So if you have a garden or if you have a certain kind of place that needs more water, that's great. But then if you have another place that doesn't, uh, don't. So uh, we are in the drought, according to the state of Washington, and our river is going to need every drop that it can get. And plus, um, it just it's going to work better for prices. It costs so much money for us as ratepayers to build the infrastructure for the highest water use in the year, which is usually sometime in the middle of July or early August. That's a huge expense that we pay. And if we can shave that down, we'll really save money. So that's my sermon on that. Anyone else have any commentary? Councilmember Kinnear. I would like to thank uh, Kara Odegaard for leading the outreach program. And I'd also like to thank my assistant, Jacoby Bird, who went to all the neighborhood council meetings, educating people on why it's important to conserve water. And people really did get on board, understood why it was important, why it was necessary. That group worked tirelessly to get the word out, to help bring people along and help them understand why this is so important. And it, it's not just because we're going to save our river or our aquifer, which we are, uh, but it's going to cost people less. And so there's that bottom line that people can relate to. I'd also like to remind people that our deciduous trees still need summer water. So if you're going to stop watering your lawn, let it go brown, you still need to water your deciduous trees. Ponderosa pines don't like summer water, as we found out in the last few windstorms. Uh, but keep in mind that our deciduous trees are our asset and they are valuable and we do need to protect them and make sure they're taken care of. So that is my, my little sermon as well. All right. 
All right, any more commentary? Councilmember Mum. Since we got to talk about water so much tonight, I want to draw out some specifics. Um, it can cost millions of dollars to build a water tower. And really, where we, when we need that capacity most is June, July, and August. And it's really building these multi-million dollar water towers for super users, people who use a lot of water. And so if you can cut back and conserve, and then your neighbor does, and then your neighborhood does, and then the whole area, it'll save millions of dollars to you. And your water rates won't be going up just for the convenience of using it a lot in June and July and August. So when you're buying your flowers and your shrubs and your trees and your lawn and your planting, think about that. Think about what's the best way long term and how we can all save money together and um, you know, we can save the, the river too. And yeah, just a shout out if you're interested in that is Spokanescape. If you just Google Spokanescape, the city has lots of plants that don't need much water that are beautiful and really fit in our environment here. So, All right, let's have, I think the last roll call of the night. Councilmember Mum. Aye. Councilmember Stratton. Aye. Councilmember Kinnear. Aye. Council Presidents and I. Councilmember Cathcart. Nay. Councilmember Wilkerson. Aye. All right. Then that resolution passes five to one. And we have some first reading ordinances. Nobody from the community has signed up to testify, so you can just read all three of them. Okay. Ordinance C-36061 relating to the establishment of new special revenue reserve funds adopting new sections, Spokane Municipal Code Section 7.08.155 and 7.08.156 to Chapter 7.08 of the Spokane Municipal Code. Ordinance C-36062 changing the zone from CB-55 community business with a 55-foot height limit to GC 55 general commercial with a 55 foot height limit for property located on the southeast corner of intersection of Sprague Avenue and Havana Street. The parcel is commonly described as 4110 East Sprague Avenue in the city and county of Spokane, state of Washington by amending the official zoning map. Ordinance C 36063, repealing the amusement device license fee, repealing chapter 8.12 of the Spokane Municipal Code and requiring the refunding of such license fees paid in 2020 and 2021. Further action is deferred on the first reading ordinances. I believe we have two people signed up for open forum, if they're still there. One of them was, I believe, Marsha. If Marsha, if you're there, if you want to hit star three, and electronically raise your hand. All right. Marsha, please introduce yourself, and you have up to three minutes. Okay, I'm in the Emerson Garfield area, and I'm happy to see that we're getting a Dollar Tree down in this area. We need more businesses. We lost two because of the shelter over there. Um, and I, I was listening to this thing. You guys were talking about how much the county put in for this shelter. I understand why the county couldn't use the money to put a shelter out in the county. I don't understand that. There's plenty of land, Indian Trail, Five Mile, uh, South Hill, the Valley. There's plenty of land out there. They could have put a shelter, but they chose not to. And you guys allowed this shelter over here. And we have to look at these people walking around here trying to find a place to sleep at night. We have to run them out of our alleys. We have to run them out of our yards. But we, we have no help. And another thing I really want to say is how come we don't have the police patrolling the neighborhood. They really need to be in the neighborhood. We had to, we caught a guy trying to get in our car. When we called the police, they all, they said, well, nothing we can do. They can look in your car. So I told them, if I look in the mayor's car, I bet you the police chief would come. But I, I, I'm just saying that we need the police to be patrolling the neighborhood. You don't see them and patrolling neighborhoods. But when I go out toward the Indian Trail area, you see more police out there. Is there more crime out there? Or on the South Hill, I go up on the South Hill, I see the police up there. So this is telling me that evidently there's more crime up there. But this is the Emerson Garfield area. We obviously, we're not making enough money, tax, tax money for the city 
to have police patrolling our area. So I would like to know why the police are not patrolling neighborhoods. Can somebody answer that for me? Yeah, so at open forum, we don't generally answer questions. We, lis we listen to your concerns and we appreciate your concerns. And I don't know if you've heard earlier today, but um, some of the council members were sharing your concerns for your neighborhood. Um, and I don't have the answer. Well, I, I was listening to it. I was listening to it. And we have a problem in this area. We do. We have to look at the homeless people tweaking our street. And in that apartment building right next to the homeless shelter, that's becoming a drug area. We saw, I, when I drove by, because I work, I have to drive by there to go to work, we saw fights out there. Mm -hmm. And where was the police? Not sitting at that shelter. Yeah. I don't, that place is becoming a drug den. And ever since that shelter got in there, it's ruined our neighborhood. It's told a pizza pipeline. They have issues with people. Now they have to hire security guards. And I say if they're going to have to hire security guards, the city should be paying for it or the county should be paying for it because the county has, should not have anything to do with the city, not at all. Um, Marsha, your time has come to an end. Thanks for hanging around and sharing okay, your thoughts fine. with us. I just okay. I got my thing. All right. Take care. Um, and Nicolette, if you're there, you can hit star three. Go ahead, Nicolette. You have up to three minutes. Thanks, guys. I just wanted to start by saying thank you for all of your hard work. Um, I know it's been a long day. I've been with you since your committee meeting. And uh, so thank you for this opportunity to speak here at the end. As you may remember, my open forum comments over the last few months have included a request for Council to facilitate a series of community discussions between the police and the community at large. I stress the need to hold these discussions not only transparently, but openly and well in advance to discussions and the upcoming, uh, the upcoming uh, negotiations between the city and the police guild. I was delighted to hear that the wheels were in motion and that discussions had begun, but I was perturbed to find out that these discussions began without public notice and behind closed doors. Although some representatives from some impacted communities were present, there were many groups from many different communities uh, who were not represented, and some members of which have a daily interaction with police officers and are in dire need of healthy, safe, and open, transparent discussions with the police and the city. There's a real question about whether or not those closed-door meetings, or that closed-door meeting, I should say, violated the spirit of the kind of transparency citizens have been voting and lobbying for time and time again to keep meetings, contract negotiations, and police reform an open and publicly accessible activity. There's also a real opportunity here to test out what a robust community conversation can look like where everyone is involved and given a chance to weigh in. I hope future community conversations are actually open to the entire community and not just those who have been invited to the discussion. If nothing else, Closed-door meetings allow the mind to wander and conspiracies about preferential treatment to breed and unverifiable misinformation to spread. Not to mention it sets a bad precedent moving forward as we approach the next round of police guild contract negotiations, which by law will be required to happen openly and transparently. Thank you again for your time. And have a wonderful day. Thank you. Um, I wanted to... Note that uh, you might have seen in the newspaper, but one of our former city council members who served before any of us served, uh, Mr. Brewer from District 1, passed away. And I, I, did, I was not living here in Spokane when I left. I left before he joined, and I came back after he was no longer. But he seemed like a remarkable person, and uh, we'll be uh, doing a salutation for him coming up. But I just wanted to note it while it was on people's minds. And then I also just wanted to note uh, that uh, Councilmember Cathcart and his wife welcomed a baby in. And I remember his first name, Atlas, but uh, Michael, could you just introduce him again, his full name to us? Yeah, it's uh, Atlas Samuel Tran Cathcart. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, we're so excited for you and Vina. 
uh, and Atlas and um, just the circle of life oh, right new here. people. There he is. Yay. Hey, Atlas. <laughs> well, that's, that's what it's all about. So We're really excited. For, yep. For the moon. Nice. All right. Well, everybody, again, as Nicolette noted, very long day, lots going on. And um, we have a study session on Thursday and then city council again next week at our committee meeting at 115. Oh, but I meant to do that during the first readings. But Candace, can you please share the screen or no? Kennelly is going to share the screen. The vaccine dates. Uh, it's not showing up on our. All right. How would you like to have your vaccination come to you? So here's your dates and times. Okay. So we already did the June 4th one, June 8th, tomorrow, 3 to 7 p.m., up on the South Hill. Fire Station 9, 1722 South Bernard Street. You can go on to srhd.org and make a reservation or just walk up and bring some friends that haven't had their vaccination yet. And then at Fire 17, which is out in Indian Trail, that's 5121 West Lowell Avenue, right across from STCU and next to the Pocket Park with the splash pad. We had a great turnout last week. Come by on the 9th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Say hi to our firefighters and EMTs and paramedics and get your free shot. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. And please take care of yourself. And if you can, take care of somebody else. We'll see you around. Take care. Have a good night.